Hey guys, welcome back to the Jefferson Charts portion of our Navigraph series. If you're new to the series, I suggest you start at 101. Link in the description below. This video builds on information from prior videos, but can stand as a single video if you're interested in airport diagram charts from Jefferson. I've also arranged this video and the whole series with chapters that you can skip ahead or back as you see fit. You can jump right to and revisit any portion easily. I'm also in no way affiliated with Navigraph or Microsoft either as an employee or sponsor of either or any of the products that they offer. This is the first part of the fourth video in a series that will walk you through from a basic understanding of what Navigraph is to an explanation of charts, procedures and plates, and how to use them to fly an IFR plan or route. Please have a look in the description for a full list of all the videos in this series. In our previous video, we looked at the different types of terminal procedure charts that you will find in Navigraph and how to access them. In this video, we will have a look at the Jefferson 10-9 airport diagrams specifically in more detail. Airport diagrams are designed to assist in the movement of ground traffic and provide airport specific advisories and assistance. Because we are looking at these charts in detail, there is a lot of information to digest. I have decided to split this video into two separate videos, 104A and 104B. This video, 104A, will explain the first three sections of the airport info charts, namely the header, comms, and airport diagram. The next video will discuss the additional runway information and takeoff and departure procedures sections of the 10-9 charts. We had discussed a little in the past videos the difference between FAA or Nav Canada charts and Jefferson charts, which are provided in Navigraph. But I want to take a bit closer look at the differences of the airport diagrams specifically. First, I'm going to bring up the Jefferson Airport diagram for um, Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport along with the FAA alternative here. First notice that the orientation of the airport is different. All FAA maps have the same orientation, but um, Jefferson, however, will change the orientation to best fit the airport to give you a larger map. Secondly, and this is a big one, all Jefferson maps are geo-referenced. This is what allows Navigraph to overlay these charts on the en route maps and allow the follow me function to work when overlaying your aircraft's position on the map while flying. Comm sectors are right on the map also. Approach lights for situational awareness are drawn right on the Jefferson charts along with roads, water, and railroad tracks. Jefferson also provides charts for all IFR airports worldwide and provides detailed information regardless of size of the airport. There are a number of other things like um, inset subcharts for complicated gate or de-icing areas, uh, low visibility taxi charts, hotspots for high traffic areas, and text box for specific advisories that you should be aware of. 109A or supplemental charts for the main airport diagram are also offered that provide additional information about runways or hotspots and takeoff or obstacle departure procedures if applicable and alternative minimums, etc. And of course, consistency. Once you learn to look for the well-placed and uncluttered information on a Jefferson chart, you will always be able to find it quickly and easily. On the FAA chart, although much of the information is provided, it is not consistent with other countries or territories around the world. Now, let's take a look at a Jefferson Airport diagram, the 10-9 or 10-9. We'll first search for our airport and click the Airport Charts button, Taxi, and our 10-9 airport info chart. First thing I'd like to point out is the format of every Jefferson 10-9 chart is as follows, and you will always find the appropriate information for each of these sections in the same place. First, our heading information is always at the top, and we will break down the information in each of these sections later in this video. Second is the communications section. Third, we have our airport plan view providing the airport diagram. Below that is additional runway information, and at bottom is our takeoff and alternative minimums information. Please note that as all airports are vastly different, not all items explained here apply to all charts. If the specific airport does not have that information published, it may be omitted. On larger airports, you will find the same information in a slightly different layout. Our hitting information is still at top. Our communication section is in the same format at top left instead of spanning the whole page. Our airport plan view now consumes the entirety of the page for visibility. Our additional runway information, takeoff minimums, and alternative minimum sections are depicted on a supplementary chart called a 109A. 
This would usually be the front and back of a paper Jeppesen chart. Let's go back to CNC3 so that we are not distracted by the wealth of information at Pearson and have a look at the heading information of the 10-9. Starting from the left, we have our ICAO, or International Civil Aviation Organization Code, or airport identifier. And if the airport has a IATA, IATA, or International Air Transport Association Code, it will have a slash and then the IATA. This would be something like CYYZ, and to the right of it, YYZ. Next, we have our airport elevation at 936 feet MSL, or mean sea level. Then the airport's geographic latitude and longitude shown in degrees, minutes, and tenths of minutes. Of course, we have our Jefferson logo in the center, followed by the revision date of the chart and the date it became effective that are both flanking the chart index number 10.9. By now, you may be getting used to the airport info or diagram chart being called a 10-9. Be aware that the one in the designation means that it was or is the first airport in that geographical location. In this case, Brampton. In some cities, you may have multiple airports, in which case the second airport would have a 29 or 20-9 20 and then a 39 for the third airport. They are more uncommon, but London is a good example with five or more airports. So just keep in mind, although an airport may be the third airport in the city, the common expression to refer to these is still 10-9. Although technically incorrect for a 30-9, it essentially means the airport diagram chart. On the right side, we have the geographic location name. This is where the airport is physically located and the airport name. Sometimes these can be very similar or the same if named after its location. Next is our communications section. Important to note is that the communications section of these charts is laid out from left to right in order of normal use and is similar across not only all airport diagrams but approach charts also. The only difference between approach charts and the airport diagrams in the communications section is the calm information presented in an airport diagram would assume a departure and an approach chart would assume, of course, an arrival and have those appropriate calm channels from left to right. In this case, in a small regional airport, we have a unicom frequency as there is no tower and Toronto terminal departure which controls this airspace above CNC3. One thing you'll see a lot on smaller strips is the asterisk or star indicating that this service is part-time. You'll also see this in a larger airport on the ground frequency for instance as they may not have ground services at certain times of night. Now here the word Brampton appears before Unicom on both left and middle and Toronto before terminal departure on right. This is the service call sign and the presence of it means that there is at least transmit and most likely receive capabilities on this frequency, meaning we can tune to this frequency and speak to anyone else listening on that frequency. If it also has receive, which it probably does, it means other pilots can also speak to us. At very least, it means you can speak to other pilots and communicate your intentions. When this is omitted, it means the service is broadcast only, like a weather service for the area. We'll take a look at that later. The next words, Unicom and Traffic and Terminal Departure are the types of functionality of the service that is available. In this case, Brampton being the call sign and meaning it's Transmit Receive, and Traffic meaning it's the Brampton traffic frequency for this aerodrome. We also see ATF, or Aerodrome Traffic Frequency, indication for this Canadian airport. This is the same as a common traffic advisory frequency and beside this our actual frequency which is the standard ATF in Canada. All available primary frequencies are depicted in larger fonts so that they're easy to read. Let's take a look at CYYZ to see how this looks there. You'll notice that our first item which might be the first thing you want to tune when you're getting your plane ready for departure is the Automatic Terminal Information Service or ATIS. Notice that it does not say Toronto in capitals in front of it like Toronto Clearance does. This means that this is a broadcast only channel and if we were trying to transmit on it we would be very lonely. Again we see the asterisk or star indicating that this is a part-time service and Toronto Clearance meaning that this is transmit receive frequency on 121.3 that offers clearance services. 
We can also see that the services are laid out from left to right in the order that we may be using them. Clearance for IFR, then apron advisory, then ground for taxi and tower for takeoff, and Toronto departure. At larger airports like Pearson, you will see multiple frequencies for single services. All right, um, let's go back over to CNC3 to take a look at the airport diagram section. So the plan view is a two-scale graphical drawing of the airport layout. A latitude grid and longitude grid in degrees, then minutes and tenths of minutes on the actual markers is depicted along the outsides of the diagram. Airport operational notes exist sometimes in specific areas if the note is tied to that area. An example might be there are migrating birds in this area between some, you know, the, the months. Or in a general area, sometimes these are, are just located in the top left or bottom right hand corner that just pertain to the airport in general. The airport's magnetic variation is depicted also numerically. In this case, a 10 degree west variation, meaning that grid or true north is in this direction, while your compass showing magnetic north will be 10 degrees west. The runways hopefully are obvious here, and the large black strips which designate a paved runway. If this runway were unpaved, it would be white instead of black with a black outline or stroke. Runway headings depicted at the end of each are always magnetic, uh, or sorry, magnetic headings unless followed by a T for true. Note the exact runway heading and runway number above it. Runway numbers are named for their approximate runway heading rounding down or up like runway 33 which is approximately 330 degrees magnetic or exactly 326 degrees magnetic. We know from the runway number that the heading is between 326 degrees and 335 degrees. The end of the runway's elevation is depicted when known. Here it is 936 feet MSL. All wind direction indicators are depicted with the little windsock symbol. Notice we have three at Brampton Airport. One of them is lighted as depicted with these little lines here which make it look like winds going through. Um, physical length of the runway in feet is largely depicted along each uh, 3,500 feet for runways 15 and 33 and 2,500 feet for runways 08 and 26. These sometimes have meter equivalents for international airports. They also don't include any stopways or overruns or anything like that. All taxiways and ramp areas are depicted in gray along with known structures in black. These may include buildings uh, outside the airport, for instance, if within the range of the scale drawing here, if that makes sense. Uh, notice the taxiway identifiers, like Taxiway Bravo or Alpha, uh, smaller taxiways, Delta and Charlie, Gulf, Alpha 2. In the center is the ARP, or Airport Reference Point, which is the latitude-longitude location that is referred to in the heading of the chart. When applicable, the physical location of displaced thresholds along the runway are shown. Displaced thresholds are the white line that is painted across the width of the runway, marking the end of the, I was going to say runway, but it's really the end of the displaced portion of the runway. It doesn't necessarily mark the end of the runway in certain circumstances, but anyways, displaced portions or portions of the runway marked with arrows at the center line are the displaced portion of the runway uh, that can be used for sort of a takeoff rollout, but you, you couldn't land on them. The small black star circled here is the location of the airport's identification beacon. Um, at the bottom, we have a scale for both feet and meters that is equivalent to the charts scale. Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's take a look at Pearson to see if we can find some more symbols and relate some of the information we've just learned to a larger international airport. Looking at uh, runway 05, we can see the runway and heading. Below it is a depiction of the configuration and length to scale of all known approach light systems. Below that, we can see the location of the Yankee Tango pop of VOR NAVAID. 
NDBs have the same symbol on these diagrams. You'll also find category 1, 2, and 3 hold short markers on taxiways that run parallel with ILS equipped runways. All GA aircraft for the most part are going to be category 1. These categories define the progressively lower weather minimum categories, one being 200 feet above the ground with a half mile visibility to category, three, or, uh, category 3C, which is zero feet and zero visibility. I'm guessing the Cat 3C approaches take some getting used to. From what I understand, uh, I'm sure someone will correct me in the comment section below, these hold short areas are designed to prevent aircraft and their equipment or the physical aircraft from interfering with the ILS system while another aircraft, for instance, is approaching on that runway while you're holding short. We can also notice that there's a windsock at this location uh, just above Taxiway Hotel. You can see Taxiway Juliet 2, uh, Juliet that runs across 15 right and 15 left to runway 23. We can again see the displaced threshold for runway 23, and below it is HS3, which refers to a hotspot. If we look at the runway incursion hotspots text box, we can see that the information for HS3, or hotspot 3, can be found on the supplemental chart 109A. Taxiways on larger charts like this can be difficult to find sometimes. Notice Tango Taxiway running through the icing facility, but changes to Alpha Lima. Taxiways with number designators are intersections of the parent taxiway. Therefore, if you're looking for taxiway hotel and see hotel two, just look where it intersects to find hotel. Taxiways like Alpha Lima describe an Alpha intersection that is going to the Lima ramp area. You can also see this in the infield area of the airport with uh, Echo Yankee and Foxtrot Alpha. Uh, you'll find these sort of beam symbols also with their identifiers, if applicable. These are known RVR transmissile meters or other type of RVR equipment. RVR is an acronym for Runway Visual Range, and we will talk about this more during our video on approaches. These symbols are just the location of the RVR measuring system at the airport. And lastly, notice the black number designators that indicate more information could be found about this spot on the map on this chart. The first one indicates to pilots of aircraft with wingspans larger than 124 feet that there's a sharp turn here. Now, the next two sections that we saw at the bottom of the chart for CNC3 Brampton or other smaller regional fields are found in the first supplemental chart for that airport in airports this size anyways, named 109A. Let's have a look. On these supplemental pages, you will also have a similar layout to each of them. General information at the top left that relates to general operations at the airport that couldn't fit on the chart itself. And the next section is the same as the, um, the next section would be on the smaller airport charts, the additional runway information. There's a lot of information here and a lot of acronyms, and we will have an explanation for this in the next video, 104B. After this is the runway incursion hotspot section. We pointed out HS3 previously near runway 23 near the top of the airport diagram. If we look at HS3 here, it informs us that taxiing eastbound on Taxiway Hotel, aircraft continue on to Taxiway Quebec and incur on runway 23. So what is this? Is this a set of instructions to enter runway 23 v Quebec? Let's have a quick look. Notice the arrow with the note right on the diagram. It states that normal runway 23 departures are from Taxiway Hotel. Runway 23 departures do not enter Taxiway Quebec without specific clearance from ATC. Okay, so do we have conflicting information here? We are being shown very specific instructions to not enter Taxiway Quebec. Let's have a look at our incursion hotspots again. What we have here is not instructions for us, but rather warnings to things that commonly happen at the airport that we should be cautious of. In this case of HS3, they're warning us that aircraft who are taxiing on hotel commonly continue on to Quebec and incur or enter the runway 
essentially without permission. And this is what the hotspots areas of the airport diagram are designed to do, is give you information as a pilot that you should be aware of, uh, especially when the airport themselves, and Jeppesen actually reaches out to each airport to get this information and publish it onto their charts so that pilots can look at them quickly and be aware, hey, um, I'm, I might want to be careful of this area of the airport when operating with it. Next is our takeoff and obstacle departure procedure information, which is the last section on our smaller airport chart at the bottom, and will usually start right after hotspots and continue to the next page, as we see here, or just start on the next side of that page, or this page, sorry. Lastly, we have our alternative minimums, which we will discuss in the next video, 104B. A few more charts that are supplementary to our airport diagram and provided by Jefferson are things like 1090e or low visibility taxi charts for airports that have these procedures, apron procedures and parking gates and other detailed views and areas of the airport. Now, Keep in mind, you are unlikely to find or be provided these additional charts or information from FAA airport diagrams. This information is procured and provided by Jeppesen and is partly why their charts are of such value to airliners and pilots alike. Let's uh, take a look at a few more airports quickly that offer us some of the geographical features that are not depicted at either of the previous airports. Here, I wanted to show you the symbol for bluffs which are depicted with the gray arrows that are pointing in the direction of the lower elevation. In this case, the airport is lower than the bluffs, which are very close to the runway. And here we can see a few more geographic references. Roads are depicted in gray like taxiways, except thinner. These diagrams will also show you train tracks and rivers and lakes. And these are tree lines that are in the area. At KNTD, we find an unidentified man-made structure that has a peak height of 157 feet MSL. Note, if it had a little almost snowflake or like stars around the top of it, this means that this man-made structure is lighted. We also see a tower at 122 feet. And there are a number of different man-made structure symbols that all look like what they are trying to depict essentially with an altitude beside them. At KLGB we have a symbol unique to intersecting runways. Lasso or LAHSO and a line which is for land hold short operations which would allow an aircraft to land at both runways, while this aircraft, landing 26R, would be required to hold short at this point after landing. Not every airport has lasso operations, so essentially they were designed to allow smaller airports who became busier to operate more efficiently. Um, the, it, there's quite a bit to these operations that the pilot have to understand, so it's not just a uh, something that ATC will direct you as a pilot, you need to understand how to operate within a land hold short operation environment. We also have a helicopter landing pad here. Notice the gray X's in three locations here. These indicate a permanently closed taxiway. On runway 30 we have an overrun and runway lights that extend to the displaced threshold. And I haven't gone through everything, but uh, this one's, I was looking for an example, and at KCMA we have a permanently closed runway. Now, the last thing we do before we wrap up, let's take a look at the Pearson International Aerodrome chart provided by Nav Canada, who does provide free charts for the airports in this country. Beside it, I'm going to put up an airport diagram from the FAA. See if you can, after having gone through this, uh, make sense of the two of them, which provide some but not all of the information provided on Jeppesen diagrams. One large difference with these freely published diagrams is the clutter and lack of distinguishing fonts and characteristics of each of the legend items. 
On top of that, just because certain information is in the top left corner of the chart for Pearson does not mean it will be there for Brampton. Sometimes they just put the information wherever it will fit. Now imagine first having to find the charts, especially international charts, familiarizing yourself with the charts for that area, and potentially doing this on the fly or in an emergency situation. I'm hoping that you are beginning to see why the majority of pilots and airlines settle for nothing less than Jeppesen charts. And with that, I hope I was able to give you a good understanding of the first three sections of the airport diagram charts, or 10-9s, and we'll have a look at the additional runway information section along with the takeoff and departure procedure section of the charts in our next video, 104B. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, please throw me a like. Either way, I hope to see you in the next video.